this week at Liberty. It's December, which means we start our new sermon series, Christmas. It's all about Jesus. The Christmas experience is next week, and we need your help. To volunteer for the event, please see Brett Halverson for more information. This evening, we'll be having our home host night. We'll meet throughout the valley in our prayer groups. For more information, please contact your prayer group leader today. This Saturday will be our family soul winning. Don't miss out as we invite the community to church. Join us on December 19th as we take our Red Box offering to support our new ministry partner, God is My Dad. Then, in the evening, we'll be having a great time of celebration as we have our candlelight service. Don't forget to pick up your devotionals out in the foyer. These devotionals go with the messages each week to help you grow spiritually. If you are a guest with us, we would love to connect with you. Please fill out a connection card in the seat in front of you and drop it in during the offering. Had a Thank wonderful you. day so far this morning as we've lifted up the name of Jesus Christ. And if you're a guest with us, we're sure glad that you chose to spend your morning with us. We hope you'll give us the opportunity to connect with you during the service. And the chair in front of you is a card that says, let's connect. Would you take some time over the next few moments to fill that out and let us connect with you today here at Liberty Baptist Church. We're going to sing about the most wonderful time of the year. The season is Christmas. And here at Liberty Baptist Church, Christmas is all about Jesus Christ because he's the one who brought joy to the world. So let's stand together and let's sing about that Savior. Joy to the world, the Lord has come. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Say 
to God in the highest, glory to God evermore. Good news, great joy for all. Melody breaks through the silence, Christ the Savior is Christmas Day, the old familiar carols play, and mild and sweet their songs repeat, of peace on earth, goodwill to
Amen. Stand with us together as we sing another Christmas carol. Some people hate that word. I was coming out of, um, I was coming out of, uh, or walking in Walmart, checking out at Walmart the day after Christmas uh, last year or two years ago, and I said to the, I said to the checkout lady, I said, "Hey, only 364 more days till Christmas." <laughs> she said, "Oh no, don't say that." Some people hate the term Christmas. They think, man, I just, I, it just, it's all, it's all crass commercialism. It's all a pagan holiday. It's all whatever. It's back in 2005, a, a man who was a reporter for Fox News wrote a, his name was John Gibson, wrote a book called The War on Christmas. Today I'm going to talk about the war against Christmas. We're going to talk about why Satan hates this war so, or hates Christmas so much. We're going to be in Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12. We like to take the entire month of December and celebrate this birth. Isn't it amazing? 2,000 years have gone by and we're still celebrating the birth of this baby. Why is that? That's because this baby was a special baby. Can you say amen to that? This baby is God in human flesh. This baby changed the course of history. This day is a day, it's a great day because it's the day that he came forth. The word Christmas, Christmas means the coming forth of Christ. And the coming forth of Christ means the demise, the absolute demise of Satan. And he knows that, that's why he hates it. That's why atheists hate Christmas. That's why the liberals hate Christmas, that's because of what Christmas means. It propagates the name of Jesus Christ who at that day came forth as a baby. And we look forward to the time he's coming forth as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Can you say amen to that? We are celebrating this great time. And by, by the way, somebody reminded me today it was the fifth. I thought it was the second. Time flies when you're having fun. And I'm having a ball. Uh, the... Um, the, the, the fact is, it's, it's, five, it's five days into December. Man, it's amazing. That means we have 20 more days to tell everybody what Christmas is all about. 20 more days where people are going to be celebrating, and some of them don't know what they're celebrating. That's why it's so essential that you get involved in this Christmas experience. Get involved in getting these flyers out, telling people about, about, uh, about Christmas, it, telling them what it's all about. I love the fact that a few years ago, there was a guy that was interviewed by Fox News, or uh, uh, let's see, not Fox News, uh, uh, Fox 5 here in, in Vegas, and uh, they were out in the parking lot. 
the guy said, I, I came here and I got a free Christmas tree. He said, I not only got a free Christmas tree, I finally found out what Christmas is all about. They tell you what Christmas is all about. That's what we want to do. We want to tell people that Christmas is all about Jesus. So get these things. Pass them out in your neighborhood. Get involved in telling people about Christmas. It's a great, great time of the year. Before we read our text in Revelation chapter 11, I want to read to you, I want to read to you a couple of uh, passages of Scripture from the Old Testament. In Genesis chapter 37, the Bible says this. Now, this is the story of Joseph. You remember Joseph. He was the favored son of Jacob. Jacob, who was later named Israel, was the son of Isaac, who was the son of Abraham. Joseph was, was this preferred child, and you should never have one child that you esteem above another, because when you do that, your brothers are going to hate you, and that his 11 brothers hated him. But Joseph was a man that God had ordained and planned he was going to use him as the leader of the nation of Israel. Now, in this story, uh, Joseph goes and he has a dream. He tells them about the, the dream, how he's going to be exalted as head over the nation of Israel. And, and, and his brothers hate him for that dream, but he, ca- he, te- he tells them another dream. The Bible says in Genesis 37 and verse 9, it says, and he dreamed yet another dream. And he told his brethren and said, behold, I have dreamed a dream more. And behold, the sun the moon, this is very important, this description. The sun, the moon, and the stars made obeisance to me. And he said to his father and to his brethren, and, to his, uh, and, and his father rebuked him and said unto him, What is this dream that thou hast dreamed? So now Jacob saying to Joseph, What are you dreaming? Shall I and thy mother, so he's the sun, she's the, uh, she's the moon, and thy brethren uh, bow the stars, Brethren, indeed come to bow down thyself, uh, ourselves to thee, to the earth. He's saying, are you saying that we, and again, Joseph in this dream is describing this woman and the, as the sun and the moon and the stars and the nation of Israel as the sun and moon and the stars bowing down to him. It's a very important description as we look at our passage this morning in just a minute. So here he says, look, uh, there's this description of the nation of Israel with the sun and the moon and the stars as a woman, all of this. And Joseph is saying, yeah, this is going to happen. And we know that happened. We know that later, after Joseph's imprisonment, after Joseph was de- de- um, delivered by his brother into slavery, he gets exalted to become the second most powerful man in the nation of, Is- uh, uh, of, uh, of Egypt, and they come The nation of Israel comes and bows before him just as he saw in this dream. Very important that you know that dream because, listen, every Jewish person alive when the book of Revelation was was, uh, written knew this story, and they understood this story. Second story you need to understand before we get into uh, the what we're going to read in Revelation, is in Genesis chapter 3. And you know the story of Genesis. Genesis, God creates man on the sixth day. In Genesis chapter 3, Adam and Eve are walking through the garden. Uh, They were told not to eat of one particular tree. They went directly to that tree, did not pass go, did not collect $200. They they went directly to that tree, and uh, Satan tempted Eve. She ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which she shouldn't have. She gave to Adam. He ate. He shouldn't have. He could have saved her, she could have saved the situation, uh, but they didn't. They deliberately disobeyed God, and in, whenever you deliberately disobey God, you wind up obeying Satan. That's just the way it is. It's not that you're a free man, you have now become enslaved to somebody who hates you. Say amen to that. And so that's what they did, and the Bible tells us that God came walking in the cool of the day and said, hey, where are you? And they finally, it all comes out, what's taking place? And so... God addresses the serpent first. The Bible says, and the Lord <clears throat> said unto the serpent, and of course we know that the serpent was, was, um, uh, was filled with Satan and being imp- impressed by Satan. So he says to the serpent, Satan, because thou hast done this, thou art cursed abo- above all cattle. And, upon, and above every beast of the field, upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. Now here's the promise. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman. There's going to be a war between you and the woman. And it's the woman. 
and between thy seed and her seed. This is a promise that there's going to be a battle between Satan and the seed of the woman. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. That is, you're going to hurt this child, but he's going to crush your head. You're going you're to be destroyed by this child that's coming. So, back in the garden, God promises Satan in the form of a serpent, I'm sending a child through a woman, and that child, you're going to hurt him, he's going to crush you, it's going to be your demise. Unto the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children. Now, just as every Hebrew person alive during the time of the revelation knew the story of Joseph, they also knew the promise that God gave to the woman and the promise that God made to Satan that Satan would be destroyed by this woman's child that would come forth. You need to understand that as we look at this war on Christmas so you will understand what we're about to read. One other passage you need to understand, and that's found in the book of Romans. In Romans chapter 9, God tells us this. He says to, about Israel, to whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of, of God and the promises, whose are the fathers and of whom, as concerning the flesh, Christ came, who is over all God blessed forever. So, God promised in the garden that there would come from the woman a seed, and that seed would be bruised by the great serpent, and, but that seed would crush the head of the serpent. That promise came, according to Romans, through, from, according to the Apostle Paul, that promise concerned all the promises of God, all the Old Testament covenants, and concerned the Christ child coming. So when this Christ child comes, Satan knows it, Israel knows it, those who are gonna read first the book of Revelation, they know, hey, there's this, there's this promise from God that a woman is going to come. There she's described as having a, 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 a being the sun and the moon and the stars collectively. She's described in this, in this beautiful way and she's, she's described as the one that's gonna bring forth his child. All the promises that God made to Israel are gonna be fulfilled through this child. All of that's gonna take place. And Satan is going to be destroyed and his works are gonna be destroyed by this child. Not only does Israel know this story, the demons know this story. Not only do the demons know this story, the angels know this story. Not only do the angels know this story, Satan hates this story. Because again, the birth of this child means his demise. Hence, there's a war against Christmas. There's a fight to stop the coming forth of the Christ. And in Revelation chapter 12, we have a, we have a description of this war. So let's read it together. Before we do, let's pray. Father, teach us from your word. I pray, Father, that I'll be able to make it clear that there is a war and that we are in the midst of that war. Actually, the war's been won, but we are in the residue of that. And we are to be declaring the victory we have because of what you have done. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for coming. Father, thank you for sending the Son. Father, we thank you for sending the Holy Spirit to control us. And I pray you teach us today. And I pray that we will be energized when we leave this place to go out and proclaim the victory that we have in Jesus because of Christmas. 
Father, I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now let's read the story. Revelation chapter 12. Note this. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, something fantastic that John is seeing. A woman clothed with the sun. Oh, that sounds familiar. And the moon under her feet. And upon her head a crown of 12 stars. This is a description. Again, every Jew that read this, every Hebrew citizen that read this thought, whoa, this is the one talked about by Joseph. The dream in Joseph in in Genesis chapter 37. On her head was a crown of 12 stars. And she, being with, with child, cried, travailing in birth, this woman is bringing forth a child and pained to be delivered just as God promised. And there appeared another wonder in heaven. And behold, a great dragon, our serpent has morphed into a great dragon. Over the millennium, the serpent has gained power and and people fall down and they worship him. So he's a great dragon having seven heads and ten horns. This represents the political influence that he has. And seven crowns on his head. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven. He led a rebellion in heaven against God. We can read about that if you want to when you go home. You can read about that in Isaiah chapter 14 when, when, when Lucifer as the one who was to guard the throne of God and reflect the glory of God, decided, I don't want to just, I don't, I just don't want to illuminate people about the glory of God. I want the position of God. I want people to exalt me. And the Bible says because of that attitude of pride and self-exaltation, he was cast down. The Bible says when he was cast down, here we see more of the story. The Bible says, and in and his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven. That's the angels that fell with him. And did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered. So Satan is there waiting for this child to come forth so he can destroy this child to devour her child as soon as it was born. And she brought forth a man-child who was to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. This is Jesus Christ. Say amen to that. And her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she hath a place prepared of God that, that they should feed her there for a thousand two hundred and threescore years. Days. Wow, what a story. Here we see the picture of the war against Christmas. The war against Christmas. We need to understand that Satan hates Christmas. He hates the coming forth of Christ. His determination was to never allow it to happen. So how did he do that? I'm going to give you six ways that he tries to destroy Satan, uh, tries to destroy Christmas. Number one, he tried and continues to try to destroy the mother. He tried and continues to try to destroy the mother. When the promise was made, now understand this, Satan is not omniscient. He doesn't know it all. He doesn't know what you're thinking. He can place thoughts in your mind, but he doesn't know what you are thinking. And so he he, he, and he works that way, but he doesn't know exactly what God's going to do. He knows no more than what God allows us to know about what is taking place in eternity and what's taking place on this earth. So he knows this. <clears throat> he knows there's this promised seed. He knows that it's coming through a woman. So what he does is he started at the very beginning to attack any child that was born of the woman. And the first two children that we know of that were born were Cain and Abel. And what did he do? He divided the brother from the brother so one brother kills another brother. He hates the birth of anyone that's going to lead to the nation of Israel. 
You can go through the entire Bible. You can find him trying to destroy, trying to keep the nation of Israel from ever becoming a nation. He, he so corrupted man that had fallen to his whim. He had so corrupted man that he put mankind at a point where God said, I'm going to destroy everything on the planet. I'm just going to destroy the planet. But he thought, no, wait a minute. The Bible says Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And the Bible says that Noah's generations were pure. So that from Noah, and you can trace the lineage, from Adam and Eve came the other son, Seth. And from Seth came the line that led to Noah. And Noah's generations were pure. And so God had to wipe out the entire world so that that promise that he made back in the garden would be fulfilled. And Noah would have an opportunity to rebuild the population. After Noah, God determined that he would establish a particular nation. And remember this, Satan is watching the whole time. What is God doing? Where's this kid going to come from? Where, what, where is this king, this future king? Where is this, this prince that's coming? And he's watching. And God establishes a covenant with Abraham. And he says to Abraham, listen, from you is going to be a, many nations. And I'm going to build from you and from your child a specific nation. And that child's not going to come through somebody, through Hagar. And it's not going to come through, uh, through some other means that child is going to come through Sarah. This is a promised child. Man, Satan's antennas go up. This is the child. I've got to destroy this child. I've got to wipe out this child. But that child, that child, Isaac, is born. And then that child has another child. And that child is Jacob. And Jacob is, is later named Israel. Israel winds up going down into Egypt. Satan is hating all of this because it's the fulfillment of the promise that you're going to be destroyed by the child that's going to come forth from this woman. Now the woman is in existence. The nation of Israel has come into existence. Satan doesn't understand all of this. He's trying to figure it out just like you and I are trying to figure it out. But God's established the nation through which the child would be born. And Satan knows it has something to do with this. So there's constant, continual uh, uh, destruction. There's constant persecution on the nation of Israel ever since its beginning. They go down into Egypt. They wind up being in Egypt for 460 years. In the last part of those years, they are, they are the slaves in Egypt. And Satan puts it in the mind of Pharaoh. That if we can just wipe out, you can, let's just wipe out this nation of Israel by killing all the men child in Egypt. Kill all the men child and you've killed the ability for this nation <clears throat> to procreate and to move forward. Therefore we've killed the woman so there'll be no child. Sort of like a perverted terminator, you understand? Arnold Schwarzenegger fans here. So... Uh, uh, look, so, but this is reality. This is happening in the spiritual realm. In Exodus chapter uh, 1, we read the story of, of Pharaoh getting this demonic thought, this satanic thought. We're, gonna wipe, we're not going to allow the nation of Israel to continue to exist. We're going to wipe out every man-child. He says, come, let us deal wisely with them, lest they multiply. We do not want them to multiply. Where did he get that thought? It's not a human thought. That comes from the devil. And the Bible says, and he said, when you do, he's talking to the midwives that are delivering these uh, Israeli children. And he said, when you do the office of a midwife to the Hebrew women and see them upon the stools, if it be a son, then you shall kill him. We're going to wipe out the the nation by wiping out the man child and we'll wipe out the woman if we can kill the woman the child will never be born and I will reign on this earth Satan hates the idea of the coming forth of the child and so let's wipe out the mother that's why throughout human history Israel is despised she is the woman 
That's why the nation of Israel is so despised. And by the way, that's why God promises to bless any nation that will bless Israel. Say amen to that. That's why it's so important that America stay on Israel's side. It doesn't matter if they're on our side. We better stay on their side because this is the woman. This is the woman. This is the one that God promised and through whom the seed came, the one that was promised in the Old Testament. All of the promises come through her. Satan's thinking, I gotta kill the woman, but he failed. Can you say amen to that? He couldn't destroy the woman, and she brought forth the child. Look at verse 4. Verse 4 says, And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered. Why? To devour her child as soon as it was born. Here's the deal. We couldn't kill the woman. We're going to kill the kid. Number two is he tried to kill the baby. He tried to kill the woman, was unsuccessful. So let's try to kill the baby. And he did just that. You remember the story. You remember the story how the, the wise men from the east came to see, following the star, came to, to, to uh, Israel to find the child. And they came to King Herod's palace and they said, we're looking for the promised king. And the king said, what a minute, wait a minute, a promised king? What about this? And he calls the scribes, and the scribes said, yeah, there's supposed to be a king. He's supposed to be born in Bethlehem. Uh, and and, and, and uh, King Herod thinks again a demonic thought. Well, I don't want somebody taking my place, place as king. I don't want somebody taking my position we're going to get rid of that kid. And he says to the wise men, listen, you go. You go to Bethlehem. And when you find that child, you come back and get us. Send word to us so we can come. I want to worship that child also. A liar, a thief, demonically, satanically controlled. I can't kill the woman, but I can kill the baby. Satan takes possession of of Herod. Herod wants to kill this child because if he kills this child, he can reign. Satan wants this child dead because if this child lives, it means his demise. He's got to destroy the kid. The Bible tells us, you know the story, the wise men went there and they were warned by an angel not to go back and tell Herod. Then God warned Joseph, he said, listen, you take my child and you go and you flee to Egypt and you stay there until Herod is dead. And that's what they did. They took off. Herod finds out that he was deceived by the wise men and he, in a rage, uh, makes a determination that every child is going to die. In Matthew chapter 2, the Bible says this, and then Herod, when he saw that he was mocked of the wise men, was exceeding wroth, and he sent forth and he slew. What a demonic, horrible, listen, whenever you're talking about killing babies, whether they're in the womb or outside of the womb, that is demonic. Say amen to that. God hates abortion. God hates the murder of children. God says this, if you injure a child, it's better that a millstone be hung around your neck and you be cast into the sea. It's better for you than to stand before him. Wow. God protects children. Satan hates children. And Satan particularly hated the birth of this child. Herod saw that he was mocked of the wise men. He was exceeding wroth, and he sent forth and slew all of the children that were in Bethlehem and in the coast thereof from two years old and under, according to the time which he had diligently inquired of the wise men. Think about that for a moment. I have a granddaughter that's under two years old. I can't imagine what it would be like. I can't even imagine... I don't want to imagine what it would be like to have a soldier come in and take her head. Have a soldier come through and run her through with a sword. But Herod ordered that, and it took place in Bethlehem. What a horrible, horrible demonic thing. Sat Why did that take place? Because Satan hates Christmas. 
Satan didn't want the Christ to be born. Satan didn't want the coming forth of Christ. He didn't want it. He hated it. And he was waiting and waiting and waiting. And now the time, I'm sending Herod, and and Herod can't do it. And he's in a rage, and Satan is in a rage, and he murders. I don't know how many hundreds of children die in Jerusalem because of the rage of Satan. He tried to kill the woman. He tried to kill the baby. He was unsuccessful. So what's his next move? His next move is to pervert the Messiah. That is to mess up the Messiah. He's born. He's now walking around. I do not believe that he knew that that Jesus Christ was God in human flesh. I just knew that I just know that he knew that this was the Son of God. He knew that this was the promised Messiah. He knew that he was the one that was going to cause his demise. So during his life, he did all he could to get him to change the message, to pervert the message, to disobey God and to obey Satan. Because if he could get him to do that, then his, 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 his power, everything, would have been diminished. It would have been nothing. And Satan would have won. Jesus is raised at 33 years of age. He goes and presents himself to John the Baptist to be baptized. John the Baptist testifies, this is the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. This is the one. Not only did John announce it, The Bible tells us that the Father in heaven said, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Not only that, the Holy Spirit uh, confirmed that by descending as as a dove from heaven and and landing upon his head. This was the Son of God. This was the Lamb of God that was coming to take away the sins of the earth. The Bible says, God the Father said, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And Satan thought, I'll change that. He'll not be pleased when I'm finished with him. And the Bible tells us this in Matthew chapter 4 and verse 11. Then was Jesus led of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. Now listen, teach you something. This is a side note. This is sort of free. This is not part of the whole message, right? Uh, Note this, that a person, often people say, man, I'm going through trials. Is God mad at me? No. Understand, this is the perfect son of God who God said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased, but he allowed him to go in. In fact, he led him into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil, not so that he would fall, but so that he could be victorious, so that he could win. He took him into the wilderness to be tempted so that he would come out victorious and he would win the battle against Satan. So Satan begins to tempt him. And the Bible says, and when the tempter came to him, this is Satan, this is that same serpent that we saw in the garden. This is the same serpent that we're reading about who is now a dragon with seven heads and crowns on his head and he's got all sorts of political power and he's ruling on the earth. In in 2 Corinthians chapter four, God calls him the God of this world. This is that one who is now coming to Jesus. The tempter comes to him and says, if thou be the son of God, command that these stones be made bread. You're hungry, you've been fasting for 40 days. Command these stones to be made bread. But he answered and said, it is written, man shall not live. Listen, Jesus answered with the word of God. He said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. I'm not dependent upon you, devil. I am dependent upon God. And that's where we need to be. God wants us to be dependent upon him. God wants us to surrender to him. God wants us to say, God, I want to obey your word. So the devil's not finished. The Bible says the devil, he's got he's to get this, this, he's got to get this Messiah, he's got to get this chosen one, he's got to get this child to deny God. He's got to get this God, child to be selfish and self-centered. He's got to get this guy, this, 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 this child to, to question God. The Bible says the devil taketh him into a holy city 
and sitteth him on the pinnacle of the temple and saith unto him, if thou be the son of God, look at this, he's questioning. He knows he's the son of God. He knows he's the Messiah. He knows who he is. Yet he says, if thou be the son of God, cast thyself down, tempt God. Make him prove him. You make him move his hand. And then if he doesn't do it, everybody will say, hey, he wasn't God. If God's gonna protect you, if you're really his son, cast thyself down, for it is written, he shall give his angels charge over thee. Now, Satan quotes scripture out of context. He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest, thou, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. He said he'd protect you. So cast yourself down. Kill yourself. Jesus said unto him, it is written, Again, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Again, the devil taketh him up. He's still not finished. Even to an exceeding high mountain. And he showeth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. I can't get him to kill himself, so I'll just get him to worship me. If, he can, if he'll worship me, he'll be no better than Adam and Eve. If he'll obey me, then he'll be no better than Adam and Eve. And man will be, dis, be under my control, and I will have won. Again, the devil taketh him into an exceeding high mountain and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. And he said unto him, remember, Satan's the god of this world, so he could give, he, he could make this promise. All these things I will give thee if thou wilt fall down and worship me. By the way, same promise he makes to you and me. Worship me, violate the principles of God, do what I tell you to do, and you'll be happy. Then said Jesus unto him, get thee hence, Satan. It is written, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Can you say amen to Jesus? Then the devil leaveth him, and behold, the angels came and ministered to him. He was out to destroy the testimony of Christ, to pervert the message of Christ. He couldn't kill the woman. He couldn't kill the baby. So he tries to pervert the Messiah, but the Messiah goes back to the scriptures and Satan is defeated. And Satan has to run. So what's the next plan? What are we going to do? What's Satan going to do to destroy this Christmas this coming forth of the Christ, what is he going to do to destroy it? He hates it. He's out to destroy it. The Bible says that he was ready to devour and for to devour her child as soon as it was born. He couldn't kill the child when it was born. He couldn't get the, the man to pervert the message. And so... He's determined now to try and kill the man. His, his next stop is to kill the man. He tried to kill the Lord Jesus Christ. Now listen, again, Satan is not om, omnipotent. He did not realize, I believe, he did not realize that Jesus Christ was actually Jehovah God in human flesh. He didn't know who he was messing with. He didn't know the power of Almighty God. He did not realize that Jesus was the Lord of glory. In 1 Corinthians, the Bible says this. He says, but we speak of, of, of the, the wisdom of God in a mystery. We're going to reveal to you a secret here. Even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory. This was something that God kept secret until he wanted it to be revealed. Which none of the princes of this world knew. That would include Satan. He did not know who he was messing with. For had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. You see, it was unjust and wrong for Jesus to be crucified, for Satan to ask for his destruction because Jesus had lived a perfect, sinless life. But he wanted this one dead. He knew this was the Messiah, and so he called for his death. He led Judas to betray him with a kiss. In Mark chapter 14 and verse 44, the Bible says, And he that betrayed him had given them a token, saying, Whomsoever I shall kiss, that same is he. Take him and lead him safely away. The Bible tells us that Satan entered the body 
of, of Judas. And, and through that body, he went and kissed Jesus, betraying him because he wanted him dead. He caused all the disciples to run. Peter had denied him. Thomas would question him. Judas had betrayed him. But in Matthew chapter 26 and verse 56 it says, but all this was done that the scriptures of the prophet might be fulfilled when then all the disciples forsook him and fled. They're all gone. He's all by himself. Satan has orchestrated all of this to kill the one who was to destroy him. He then used wicked men to hang Jesus on a cross. In John chapter 19, the Bible says, then delivered he him, therefore unto them to be crucified. And they took Jesus and they led him away. And he bearing his cross went forth into a place called the place of the skull, which is called in the Hebrew Golgotha, where they crucified him and two other men with him on either side and Jesus in the midst. They crucified him. Satan led them to crucify him. That was not all. They placed him in a sealed tomb. Satan said, we're securing this thing. It's all over. I couldn't kill the nation of Israel. I couldn't kill him at his birth. I couldn't get him to pervert the message, but I've killed him. He's in the grave. It's all over. Acts chapter 13 says it this way. And though they found no cause of death in him, yet they desired Pilate that he should be slain. And when they had fulfilled, I love this verse, it says, and when they had fulfilled all that was written of him, they took him down from the tree. Note this, when these wicked men had fulfilled exactly what God intended for them to do. It's amazing. Don't ever think that God's not in control. God even uses wicked men in their wicked perverted thoughts, in all of their wickedness, God uses them to accomplish his purpose. Say amen to that. Amen. You're not to fear Satan. God's not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. God will use even people with wicked intent to fulfill his purpose. They wanted him dead. Satan wanted him dead. Satan wanted him on that tree. Satan wanted him in the tomb. And the Bible says, and when they had fulfilled all that was written of him, they had to do what they had to do in order for his word to be fulfilled. They took him down from the tree and they laid him in a sepulcher. But, can you say amen to that? But God, but God raised him from the dead. And he was seen many days of them which came with him from Galilee. This was not some secret resurrection. Hundreds, probably thousands of people saw him. Who are his witnesses unto the people? Satan said, we'll kill him. I can't, couldn't kill Israel, I couldn't kill the baby, I couldn't pervert the message, and so I'm going to kill the man. And he did. But Jesus raised from the dead. Our God raised from the dead. And so now Satan's got the dilemma. He's got a resurrected Christ and thousands of witnesses. What am I going to do to stop this? What am I going to do to stop this? He couldn't stop the, the Israel. He couldn't stop the woman. He couldn't stop the baby. He couldn't stop, he, he couldn't pervert the message. He couldn't kill the man. So his next thing is you and me. The next thing is he tried to silence the witnesses. He tried to silence the witnesses. Nobody's going to tell this story. Nobody's going to tell this story. He, he got those who were the spiritual leaders, the so-called spiritual leaders of Israel, to rise up against his witnesses as they did against Christ. Those that had threatened and taken the life 
of the Lord Jesus, now were threatening his apostles because the apostles went out and preached, this one whom you crucified has risen from the dead. And they were taken captive, James and John and Peter, they were taken captive, captive and they were threatened. In verse, uh, Acts chapter 5 and verse 40, the Bible says, and to him they agreed. And when they had called the apostles and beaten them, they commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus, and they let him go. Can I tell you this? You are a lost cause to Satan. Ron, there's no way he can get you to hell. You're going to heaven. He, the fact of the matter is, once you've trusted Christ as your Savior, you're on your way to heaven. You can't, you can't get out of it. Satan can't get you out of it. You're a lost cause. He doesn't care what you think. Steve, he could care less what you think. What he doesn't want is for you to talk. You can, he, you can, you can think whatever you want. He just doesn't want you telling anybody what you think. If he can keep you silent, then... He's one. And the idea now is, I can't get the kid. I couldn't get the mom. I couldn't kill the man. So I've got to hush the witnesses. i got to keep everybody quiet. I don't want them telling. This message can't go out. Because it's to my demise, this message of Christmas that Jesus came forth. I can't let anybody hear it. And that's why it's so important that we tell everybody about Jesus. Can you say amen to that? He hates it. We were going into Disneyland. For over the last 20 months, our staff has struggled hard to keep this ministry going. From the beginning of COVID, we have, we have faced one battle after another. And there's been struggles financially, there's been struggles in every way. We thought, hey, it's time that our staff get some relief. And so we de determined to take the entire staff to Disneyland and celebrate Christmas. That was gonna be our Christmas party this year. So Friday, we went to Disneyland. I know some of you, some of you are thinking, Disneyland, who would wanna go there? You're just as bad about Christmas as you are about Disneyland. <laughs> So we, we decided to take the whole staff there. So, so I, uh, I, we, I got a church van, and I, the Berkeys ran, ran road with us, and we went down to Disneyland. We got into the Disneyland parking lot. We got there at like 8 o'clock in the morning. You say, 8 o'clock in the morning? Yeah, actually, it was 10 minutes till 8. You say, you're a fanatic. Yes, I am. And uh, so I, we, got there at, at, uh, we got there at 10 minutes till 8, got out of the van. We were, and as we were getting out of the van, there's Kim Fox and her two daughters. And I said, hey, said, hey, good to see you. And so let's go through this thing together. And so, so we were going to go down, and we were going to go through the parking lot and get out, in, uh, uh, get out, and you have to walk through all security checks and all these kind of things and find out what you have and what you don't have. So we went through, and I got through, my wife got through, and, and, all of our, and the Berkeys got through, and the kids got through, and, and then uh, uh, everybody got through except the Fox family. There was not, Kim was okay, and Reagan was okay, but Carissa. Carissa was carrying a pocket knife. I thought, what are you? A Disneyland here? And, and so she said, I didn't think about this. My grandpa gave it to me. So it's Stan Mitchell's fault. <laughs> so Stan, so she had this pocket knife. She said, I carry this with me wherever I go. And she said, she said I, I, I didn't even think about it. They said, well, you could either toss it or give it to us and maybe come back and find it at the end of the day, but chances are you're not going to find it. Or one of you can run it back to your car. And so Kim said, I'll run it back to the car. So she runs all the way back. While we were going through the line to get in, or going through security, Trey reached into his pocket, got out a gospel track, Christmas, it's all about Jesus, handed it to one of the security guards and, uh, and, and just did that and, and left. When Kim came back through the line to get in, to get back into Disneyland, she, she, she walked over to the security, and, the lady, and a lady said to her, hey, come here. And the lady said, uh, said Were you, weren't you with that group that just came through? Yeah. She said, that young man gave that man right over there one of these cards. Well, yeah, that would probably, he would have done that. 
she said, I got to tell you something. That man's wife just died three or four weeks ago. He has been telling me the last three or four weeks, I've done everything I can to encourage him. He said, I have nothing to live for. I have nothing to live for. I have nothing to live for. Today, you gave him something to live for. Can you say amen to that? Yeah, you can clap for that. Praise the Lord. Handing a gospel track can be life transforming. We need to, but Satan will tell you, hey, that security guard's not gonna wanna hit, he's gonna, he's got a gun. Uh, don't, don't mess with him. Don't give that person a track. Don't give that person a track. Don't tell that person about Jesus. Hey, if you go start inviting people to the Christmas experience, they're gonna think you're a nut. Go ahead, be a nut for Jesus. Okay, say amen to that. Tell somebody about Christ. Get out there and tell them that Christmas is all about Christ. I'm gonna tell you what, there's somebody who hates, 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 hates Christmas, and his name is Satan. And he's going to do everything he can to keep you from telling other people that Christ has come forth. Say amen to that. Don't let him do it. Just determine I'm going to do it. You say, well, it takes too much effort. Make the effort. Jesus made an effort for you. Let's go out and tell everybody Christmas is all about Jesus. Well, he couldn't. He couldn't stop the witnesses. It's 2,000 years later, and we're still witnessing. There are billions of people on the planet who claim the name of Jesus Christ. We need to be witnesses. So he can't, couldn't do that. So here's his last effort. He tries to prevent the celebration of his birth. He tries to prevent the celebration of his birth. So people who are atheists and people who hate Christians and people who hate the Christmas story will do everything they can politically, in business. You can't say Merry Christmas, say Happy Holidays, anything. I was in the second grade and my teacher said to me, uh, now children, you need to understand that in a few years they're not gonna say Merry Christmas anymore. They're gonna say Merry Xmas and they're gonna change the, the cry. I remember this in the second grade. I went home and told my mother and she said, not around here, Ron. And uh, the, the fact is there was, there's been a determined effort. There is a determined effort uh, to, to remove Christ from any of our public displays. You can have anything else, but don't say Merry Christmas don't say Merry Christmas. I loved, I, drive, I was driving through In-N-Out Burger uh, yesterday uh, to get some health food. <laughs> and uh, driving through, and uh, the In-N-Out Burger had a sign, uh, the, 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 all, all, their, all of their, uh, their name tags have got Merry Christmas. I said, hey, Merry Christmas, Merry Christmas, here. And I give them gospel tracts. This will tell you what Christmas is all about. Just tell people. People are all open and ready. You got 20 days till Christmas. Tell people about Jesus Christ. We need to celebrate him. We need to celebrate him. The angels celebrated him. The angels celebrated. The Bible says this in Luke chapter 2. They said, fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy. You can see the excitement in this angel's voice, which shall be to all people, for unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And suddenly, it's just like the angels couldn't hold themselves back. Suddenly there was with the angels a great multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. Let's try that. Let's say glory to God together. Glory to God. One more time. Glory to God. That's wonderful. Glory to God in the highest peace on earth. That's the angels. If the angels can say it, we should say it. The shepherds celebrated their birth. In Luke chapter 2 and verse 17, the Bible says, and when they had seen it, they made known abroad the same which was told them concerning this child. They couldn't hold it in. They had to tell everybody. We saw the Christ child. The wise men celebrated his birth. In Matthew chapter 2, the Bible Bible says, now when, they aimed, when, the, when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east, from Jerusalem, saying, where is he that is born king of the Jews? We have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. If the wise men did it, if the angels did it, if the shepherds did it, then you and I ought to praise God and celebrate his birth. Say amen to that. That's where it ought to be. We ought to tell everybody, you have a great, great opportunity. I have great opportunity in the next 20 days to tell everybody about the coming forth of Jesus. Let's get busy. 
Let's take the next seven days. Let's tell everybody about the Christmas experience. Let them come here. They're going to hear the gospel message. There will be hundreds of people that hear how they can know they're going to heaven. You can invite your friends who would never go to church. You can say, we're having a pagan celebration at the church. Come in. We're going to show you what Christmas is all about. We're going to have rock climbing walls. We're going to give away Christmas trees. We're going to do all that. You say, why do you spend all that money and take all that time to do that? Because we want your friends to come here and we'll tell them about Jesus. Say amen to that. So you get involved. You say, how are my friends going to hear about Jesus? If you invite them to the Christmas experience. Let's get involved because Christmas is all about Jesus. And if you've never received Jesus, listen, he came to this earth and did all that he did so you could have eternal life. And today you can call on him and ask him to save you. If you've never done that, do it today. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Father, thank you for the privilege of being able to tell other people about Christ. I pray as we celebrate this season, thank you, Father, first of all, for sending Jesus. Jesus, thank you for coming. Holy Spirit, thank you for for coming to fill us so that we can tell other people about you. And I pray, Father, you'd fill this church. Father, fill each one of us with the desire to tell other people about you. And Father, use us to to tell this entire city. God, I pray that next week we will see multitudes of people come to know you as Savior because people here today have made a determination to tell other people about you. Father, use this uh, message. Father, right now, if there's somebody here that's not saved, I pray for their salvation. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. I want to ask a question. Do you know for sure if you died right now, you'd go to heaven? If you do, would you slip up your hands as a testimony to that? Thank you. You can put your hands down. Maybe you couldn't raise your hand. Maybe you'd say, preacher, I don't know I'm going to heaven. I'd like to know that, but I don't. Please pray for me. I won't embarrass you. I won't point you out. But if you're here and you say, preacher, I don't know that. I don't remember ever asking Jesus to give me eternal life. But I'd like to do that today. I'll share with you how you can do that. But I need to know that you're here. You say, preacher, pray for me. I don't know for sure. I didn't raise my hand a minute ago. But to be honest, I don't know for sure I'm going to heaven. Please pray for me. Anybody like that? Okay, I see that hand way in the back. I'll pray for you. Anybody else? I don't know for sure. If I died right now, I'd go to heaven. Please pray for me. Anybody at all? Anybody else? Hold it up high enough for me to see it. Okay, I see that hand up here on the front. I'll pray for you. Anybody else? Anybody else? Hold it up. I wait for just a minute. Okay, I see that hand as well. Anybody else? Pray for me. I don't know for sure if I died, I'd go to heaven. Pray for me. Father, I pray for these three that raise their hand. And Father, there may be others here that are not sure they're going to heaven. I pray that before they leave here, that they will call on you, ask you to give them eternal life, and leave here knowing they're going to heaven. I pray this in Jesus' name. Your head's still bowed and eyes are still closed. Would you just say these words to Jesus? If you raised your hand a minute ago, just whisper these words. Just write out loud, but whisper them. Say, dear Jesus, I know that you are God, and I believe you died to pay for my sins, and I believe you rose from the dead. And right now, in the best way I know how, I'm calling on you, And I'm asking you to be my Lord and my Savior and my God. Thank you, Jesus, for dying for me. Help me now to live for you. The Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you just prayed that prayer and you meant it, you've become a child of God, and that's wonderful. Christian, we need to tell other people about Christ. We need to use this Christmas time. And the next seven days are so essential to tell other people about Christ. Invite them to the Christmas experience. We're going to give them the gospel in a clear-cut fashion. Make a commitment to God to get in touch with somebody and invite them next week. Father, use what has been said. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Christmas is all about Jesus Christ. Get involved. Don't waste the time. Tell somebody about Jesus. Get them here. Next week, it's going to be exciting. It's going to be great. I get 15 minutes alone with your friends to tell them how to know for sure they're going to heaven. And then they're going to see everything else that's going on. Just get your friends here next week. Get your enemies here. They can become your friends. Get anybody here. Tell them everything is free because we want them to hear about Jesus Christ who freely gave his life so we could have eternal life. Can you say amen to that? Get involved. Don't miss out. In 1917, the United States government enlisted the help of Uncle Sam to recruit volunteers for the war effort. Here at Liberty Baptist Church, we have recruited the Christmas Queen to help us with the war, with the Christmas experience effort. She put together a motivational video for those of you because we need help with volunteers in the games. We need help in recruiting uh, people to come. So we have a message from the Christmas Queen. Please turn your attention to the screens provided. Halverson, he'll get you ready for the match, December 12th. Gone into this, we've really, there's people have been preparing and thinking about this for weeks and months, and it's just one week away. So out in the lobby, uh, you will find all of the Christmas, it's all about Jesus Christ, but there are special event flyers for the Christmas experience. Those are in both of the lobbies. You can pick those up. We want next week to be a great week. We do need help. We have some things, we call them reindeer games, and everybody's allowed to participate regardless of the color of their nose. They're allowed to participate in the reindeer games, but we need folks to help facilitate those. If you can see Brad Halverson at the welcome desk, if you want to volunteer and help, we would love to have your help. Last week, we introduced to you our Christmas offering, and on both of these tables on your, uh, the way out of the building, you'll see that uh, there are red boxes on uh, December 19th, two weeks from today, every single dollar that comes in will go towards God is My Dad Ministries. They're opening up a new chapter in partnering with us, the police department, and our community partners to reach fatherless children here in the city of Las Vegas. I'm really excited about Sean and Jackie being here, and uh, they actually are arriving this week, and we want to give them an encouraging gift as they chapter with uh, or they partner with us in a new chapter of God is My Dad's Ministries here in Las Vegas starting uh, in the new year. Everything that comes in for those offerings on December 19th in a red box will be given to them, or you can donate specifically to that online. Let me invite the ushers to come forward and receive this morning's offering. As they do, Tiffany will be playing a special. As soon as Tiffany's special is complete, as soon as Tiffany's special is complete, uh, we will be dismissed. So I'm going to pray for the offering. Let me remind you, as we did at the beginning of the service, if you have 
not already filled out one of these connection cards, if you're a guest with us, we have a gift for you in the lobby. But uh, we like to connect with every single person through prayer requests and uh, know what's happening in your life. You can fill out that information on the back and drop it in the offering plate as it goes by in a moment. Would you join me for prayer? Father, we thank you for the privilege of being in your house today. I pray that you would bless each person who's here and use what has been said in this place for your glory as we seek to tell this community that Christmas is all about Jesus Christ. In your name we pray. Amen. <laughs> 